Welcome to our virtual program lecture meet. Tonight, our program is questioning the collective imagination of contemporary issues with Professor Shaliza Ibrahim from the Institute for the Study of University Pedagogy. We always start with a land acknowledgement, which I will read. We acknowledge the lands which constitute the present day city of Mississauga as being part of the treaty and traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Huron-Wendat and Wyandot nations. We recognize these peoples and their ancestors as peoples who inhabited these lands since time immemorial. The city of Mississauga is home to many global indigenous peoples. As a municipality, the city of Mississauga is actively working towards reconciliation by confronting our past and our present, providing space for indigenous peoples within their territory to recognize and uphold their treaty rights and to support indigenous peoples. We formally recognize the initial origins of our name and continue to make Mississauga a safe space for all indigenous peoples. Next, we're going to do a quick overview of WebEx. On your screen, you'll see a chat box on the right hand side with the blue arrow. You can select to message the host or panelists. You can share your questions and comments during the program using this feature, and they'll be featured in the Q&A at the end of the session. Closed captioning is, unveil is, is, is enabled for this program. You can turn captioning on or off by clicking on the CC button on the bottom left hand corner, indicated by the yellow rectangle. Once the captioning is turned on, you can also adjust for the font size and the background color to light or dark by clicking on the three dots at the end of the black bar that appears. Finally, the box in the middle with the green arrows is for reactions. You can let us know how you feel about what is being shared. Please feel free to interact. Next, we have some library information for you. Many of the 24-7 digital services offered by Mississauga Library are available for free with your library card and also available from your home at mississaugalibrary.ca. We offer a large collection of ebooks and audiobooks through Libby by Overdrive and Hoopla. Hoopla also offers music, movies, TV shows, and comics. You can access digital magazines through Flipster and RB Digital. Press Reader has newspapers from all over the world in more than 60 languages. Free downloadable and streamable music is available through Freegal, and you can learn a huge selection of languages on Mango languages. LinkedIn Learning offers opportunities to learn all kinds of new skills, everything from 3D animation, finance, and even writing skills. Please visit our website or call us for details. Our library newsletters are a nice way to find out what's happening at the library and other interesting news. Sign up for weekly newsletters so you can learn more about our upcoming programs and services. We have our Lecture Me program lined up for the fall. On October 3rd, Indigenous storytelling has taken many different forms, and one of the most recent forms is film. Professor Ken Derry considers the way in which a number of recent Indigenous films made in Canada connect with Métis scholar Joanne Piscanu's understanding of how stories can help with healing. And on November 7th, we will, imagination, we will imagine the futuristic classroom while reflecting on the warnings and cautions from the founders of the technologies themselves. Learn about current research to assess immersive technologies as they are used to support vulnerable learners and the promise of AI and VR environments as a safe training space. I'll be back for the Q&A session, but right now I'm going to turn the mic over to James Malinowski from UTM, who will introduce our speaker. Thank you, Lucy. Good evening, everyone. In collaboration with the Mississauga Library System, we thank you for attending tonight's first Lecture Me talk of the 2023-24 season. My name is James Malinowski, and I am the Community Engagement Officer in the Experiential Education Unit within the Office of the Vice Principal, Academic and Dean at UTM. It is my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Professor Shaliza Ibrahim, who will be delivering a talk entitled, Questioning the Collective Imagination of Contemporary Issues from a Science and Numeracy Lens, from the Institute for the Study of University Pedagogy. Professor Ibrahim's research focuses on higher education and the design of socially just teaching practices in the field of mathematics, science, and STEM education. 
Her research projects span across local and international contexts, such as Canada, Jamaica, and St. Vincent and the Grenadines. When on campus, she teaches courses such as numeracy, critical thinking for STEM, or the science of learning. When off campus, she is traveling in search of a good hiking trail. Her favorite hikes include reaching the summit of Mount Fuji in Japan and La Soufrière in St. Vincent. Over to you, Professor Ibrahim. Thank you very much for that introduction, James. I appreciate that. Um, welcome to everyone to this talk as well. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about com contemporary issues and how they're understood and shaped by the collective imagination. In this lecture, I will share how I introduced young scholars to the critical thinking required to navigate perspectives and positions through quantitative reasoning and socio-scientific understanding. The students use the conceptual framework of critical visualization to capture images from local societies and analyzing them using frames of reference grounded in critical pedagogy and place-based education. They questioned how socio-scientific values influence contemporary issues and how quantitative reasoning and data interpretation validate our understanding of these contemporary issues. And some of the issues um, examined include food security, local greenhouses, STEM careers for Black professionals, wildlife preservation, and communication during the pandemic. I might not be able to share them all, but I'll share quite a few. I know that I uh, also acknowledge the land that I did this research in and that I also work in. I'm actually connecting with you right now from Oakville, Ontario. And my parents immigrated here in the 70s and share some shared histories tied to the colonial realities of the ancestors that actually guides my relationship to Canada as well. So I um, am acknowledging our colonial connection uh, through those histories, and I am grateful to be living on this land and using their stories, beliefs, and concepts to guide my own work uh, and inspire me as well. In fact, this image is taken by one of the students during our learning experiences together, and it is of the TP right on the Mississauga campus at the University of Toronto. So to think a little bit uh, about this uh, talk, I think I should begin by setting the stage for this research a little bit. So I will share my own academic journey le leading to this moment. I will then talk about how science and math education informs my research and the approach I take in this talk. I'll share some examples from higher education and invite you all to think about university pedagogy from the perspective of what it means to learn in post-secondary spaces as a place for critical thinking and intellectual growth. And then of course, I'll connect to my study that starts to reframe the collective imagination around scientific topics, particularly socio-scientific topics so that we see how issues in science are complex and grounded in history, politics, environment, and social dimensions as well. I begin my journey myself actually at the University of Toronto on the Mississauga campus. So I've always loved maths, um, but I was, actually I've always loved sciences, sorry, but I was always better at maths. But holding true to my passion, I pursued biology, I did masters uh, in science communication and a PhD in science. Um, education. But I think somewhere in my subconscious, mathematics would always be an important subject that I returned to. Um, and you can see, if not in my mind when I was trying to figure out the efficiency of my path, but in my professional academic journey as I would go on to research uh, mathematics, teach mathematics courses, and then work as a mathematics professor, uh, first at Brock um, and now as a numeracy prof at U of T. Um, but I, of course, I'm more than a scholar. I am a parent, and that has certainly shaped how I think about learning and the evolving learning trajectories we have from child to adult as we develop and grow cognitively. So I really love this quote. It's uh, by Bo Ren that encapsulates so much for me. It's, my parents were tasked with the job of survival, and I was self-actualization. The immigrant generational gap is real. What a luxury it is to search for purpose, meaning, and fulfillment. And in my journey of self-actualization and enlightenment, I can ask really profound questions that I'm able to research on, 
but I'm also able to work on myself and find those moments in, of enlightenment through the hiking that I've been able to do, and also through opportunities to travel for my work and share my work, my research, and to collaborate with others, um, such as in Jamaica and St. Vincent and the Grenadines, and also in the U.S. So I, my research is really grounded in education. I grew up in the notion that education is an important asset for social mobility and my parents studied under British education systems that often govern the West Indies. So I'm also trying to think about what education meant to them in a colonized space and what education might mean to me as I speak, um, as I seek purpose and enlightenment in my own learning journey. And I wanna premise this study um, by recognizing that it is still a work in progress. I'm a work in progress and a lifelong learner. And I don't often ask myself, what am I doing or what have I done? But I ask myself, what have I left undone? A reminder from a scholar named Rudolf Weir. When I think about what I've left undone, it makes me want to really evaluate how science and mathematics is being taught and what should we do to make these subjects connected to all learners, meeting them where they are at, not simply in their skill level or comprehension level, but also meets them where they live, how they live, what they believe in, and who they are surrounded by. And what I mean by that is I know that I teach science and mathematics education and concepts of cognition and learning in higher ed, but within these conversations, I'm always weaving in culturally responsive ideas, the nature of science and the nature of math, and the social construction of knowledge that exists within those spaces. Because I, I want, my students to understand that a diversity of voices are needed to solve many of our problems in the world so that my students feel empowered to bring their whole identities to the conversations, the ideas, the problems that they're contemplating in this academic space and hopefully beyond and into their future professional careers. I always remember a student from a science education course I was teaching that left me this course evaluation um, telling me to stick to the science concepts and leave the social justice connections out. And ever since then, I've been even more transparent about why these concepts and knowledge systems and ideas of knowing are important. It was in that moment I realized how epistemologies from different cultures were easily erased by dominant cultures. This is that idea of the sort of collective understanding how traditional ways of knowing from systems of knowledge that have become so mainstream, so common, that we don't even recognize how different teaching and learning could actually be. So I'm curious about how we can teach subjects through lens that complicates what we think about what we know in science and math and other forms. And I recognize how teaching is a form of activism for me. It's a place for me to open up critical discourse on contemporary issues and question the collective understanding to reimagine other understandings. And I see uh, this form of activism as, uh, as education, as a place, a beautiful place for possibility, which is why this James Baldwin quote is so perfect. I, I know that education was built in institutionalized frameworks that unethically positioned power and knowledge structures in very particular ways, but I know that decolonization of education can allow us to be very hopeful in this space and truly empower us to make pedagogical decisions that essentially could be very, very good. So I'm aware of sort of the broad audience that's with me today, which is so lovely. I've never done a public lecture like this. So I don't wanna to get too theoretical, but I cannot neglect mentioning the theoretical frameworks that I'm using. So also in that vein, recognizing the varied audience here today, what I'm doing here is situating my research in scholarship and theory, because it is in the way that I bring my work on scientific or numeracy ideas to these theories that I create other considerations. And as an academic, we get to make connections and bring ideas together to create knowledge. And then we apply it and see what we get in terms of what it might look like in practice. It's kind of like medical doctors putting into practice medical research. So here I am sharing what educators would put into practice from educational scholarship. So my theories draw on critical pedagogy and place-based education. And through some early data, I think over a decade now old, that I had analyzed, I could identify an approach to learning and teaching that I called critical place-based science education where educators are not only considering how to teach to satisfy the curriculum, the institutions or themselves, but they're considering the situationality of the learner within their environments and in their communities and with self. 
So this could be seen as quite radical in learning spaces like science and math that traditionally uphold a more deliver and receive approach to learning. Instead, learners guide how we should understand a science phenomena or a set data. Um, and, but before I get to that um, theory, right? So let me just try to define these two for you. So critical pedagogy provides a theoretical framework to examine issues of power and challenge the biases and oppressive structures that can undermine learning. And any readings by Paulo Freire would be transformative if you're looking to read more in this field. Place-based education, this scholarship complicates how we navigate the ways in which we reclaim places through our interactions with land. And reclamation is an act of decolonization as we connect the land through the lens of the first peoples or from our own making and not through the prescribed ways of knowing the land through the lens of settlers. This resonates even more in our current world where we see settler, coloni colonies, settler colonization in Canada's impact on Indigenous communities. And the work of reclamation can actually be a very harsh struggle. So place-based theories focus, forces us to look at the true history of the land and uncover truth in that history. And this is um, a read that uh, you can also look at. And so I try to bring research in these theories together. So I draw on the theoretical discourses of critical pedagogy and place. And by putting those together, research asserts that a critical pedagogy of place promotes ecological thinking and critical social analysis. And reflecting on one's own situation corresponds to reflecting on the place that one inhabits. Acting on one's situation often corresponds to challenging one's relationship to a place. It is this spatial dimension of situationality and its attention to social transformation that connects critical pedagogy with a pedagogy of place. So this article kind of encapsulates that connection and I encourage you to read it. So there are many ways of approaching learning, but these theoretical frameworks help me recognize how epistemologies for math and science are actually socially constructed. They're understood through discourses such as Western and European thought. I start to explore ideas that made me realize that there are multiple ways of solving one math solution or there are many factors in a data set that needs to be understood in order to quantitatively reason to understand why the math existed the way that it did. I love that funny phrase that the math is not mathing. Um, or in science, um, that science was this interdisciplinary idea that it's complex and that not one scientific concept needed to be understood through its, that all scientific concepts actually also needs to be understood through its political, economic, social, environmental, historical dimension, dimensions in order to truly understand why the science existed the way that it did as well. So I try to reimagine collective understandings of socio-scientific or numeracy issues through an activity called critical visualization. And as a sidebar, critical has a clear meaning when used in learning. It's thoughtful thinking, thoughtful decision-making, so I will use photographs and other visuals that seemingly capture what looks like a single entity. But when examined more cl closely, we can discuss a myriad of nuanced networks and actors at play and many dimensions to that single entity. So the other premise is to get young scholars connecting to the language from their own frameworks of knowing as well. So recognizing that they're in an educational system with me that tends to reflect the dominant culture and over time the dominant values behaviors and beliefs associated with this dominant culture become so ingrained it becomes almost invisible so i ask them to think about some guiding questions that they look at the visuals as young scholars so they can expand their thinking past these dominant assumptions so these are just a few of those kinds of questions and these are some of the images that they might look at. Um, I love using visuals such as Ed Pertinsky's work for manufactured landscapes, and they unpack some of the more nuanced discussions around waste. These ship shipwrecks um, are on the shorelines of Bangladesh, the image to the left, and um, the tire uh, yard uh, is from California, and there's also images from in Ontario. So we might talk about the skill it takes to dismantle these ships, the so 
societal impact. We talk about solutions, recycling systems, governance and jurisdictions over where waste is placed. The freedom that cars give, that a, driving a car gives us, um, ideas around autonomous vehicle design and options to do away with tires, maybe flying vehicles and, th and so on. So you can see how nuanced the conversations can be from one image. Here's some other images that I like to use. Um, this is from a book called Hungry Planet. So again, some really great reads or um, if you're looking for something to purchase, the manufactured landscapes, and then of course this one, Hungry Planet. And here it sparks discussions on food security, packaging, local grown versus export, and catering to diversity of communities and so much more. You can see how um, nuanced the conversations can be and how complex. I also try to look at current images and um, you know, try to see these sort of snapshots in time. Here, some of these are captioned as a natural disaster in the Caribbean. The ones below are from natural disaster in British Columbia, but the complex discussions resulted in discussion of the temperature of the earth and global warming, or how data is generated to determine temperature and the change of temperature over time to understand global warning, warming, how climate disasters might be predicted to save lives. We talk about the study of meteorology, as well as eco-justice and geographical eco-justice, thinking about communities that inhabit geographical locations that have historical and political boundaries. Um, so you can imagine the possibilities here. So this initial data was with middle school students, but I have been doing this uh, research with young scholars now in uh, undergraduate uh, level at the university level. And then I have this glorious opportunity to work in the active learning classrooms at the some of the newer buildings in the University of Toronto Mississauga campus. And these active learning classrooms allow visuals to have a whole new life in these technological places where we can draw on social media perspectives, current news, not just ourselves. Uh, and it has become quite powerful to have research available at our fingertips in real time while exploring these socio-scientific and numeracy issues with young scholars, all of a sudden something that had that maybe they had read about or had seen had been taking you know space in their mind in a very particular way has been reimagined in a completely new way that is actually more truthful in many ways as well as they start to uncover multiple perspectives. So this is the um, critical visualize, visualizing activity which is really a stepping stone for us to get critically thinking about the complex reality of things that exist around us. The more important task is looking into our own images of our own environments and communities, places of work, where we study and where we call home. So I invite them to do that. Give me a moment here. To extend this work, I asked students to choose a photo or identified community issue or science or numeracy issue and do the research and, and maybe even problematize a solution. I encourage them to research those issues and topics. Of course, they do so by examining literature so that their claims and arguments are informed and not opinion-based, and I plant a, a seed of action where they might identify actionable steps to reducing harm or creating a product that is sustainable or uncovering a truth, truth towards reconciliation or mobilizing knowledge and awareness. This critical pedagogy Venn diagram above reiterates the importance of social justice within the critical pedagogy framework. Agency and power and privilege interconnect with social justice and are important underlying concepts for social justice as well. So specifically, student agency is quite important. And social justice is this idea of acting with equality and fairness and dignity to all humans. And this power and privilege involves our evolving and reflecting understanding of what position we truly inhabit in these spaces. So they're now examining their own places 
through, uh, you know, a very complex and nuanced lens, but I've given them the tools ahead of time to think critically in the space. And that position um, that we have and we hold in these spaces have resulted in some very possible possibilities, sorry, very powerful possibilities for our future. So here, students researched and analyzed um, like statistics on black representation in STEM careers and professional fields, fields, and they considered the impact a program might have where young black youth get it to experience university research. And at UTM, we have a program like this. And one of the courses that I that they are taking with me, they can choose any contemporary issue to research about. But the fact that they decided to explore their own experience in university taking a STEM course is kind of like the epitome of empowering students to study from their own importance. So that is sort of a beautiful finding from the kinds of work and research that this pedagogical intervention can, can um, fulfill. In this other example, I had a grad student who had a strong connection to the special education students at a local high school close to where she grew up. And they were working in a group, these, this group of grad students. And so two of the other members were actually former forest marshals. So they were thinking from their own perspectives and bringing together ideas. And they decided they wanted to connect with the youth and have them share what science is to them through art. And then they plan this installation in the forest on campus. So opportunities to, reser to research and move towards agency like this is such a powerful way to reimagine who creates art, where's art exhibited as well. So this is another example. And then here, um, one of my undergrads had this fascinating observation of the amount of computers that was being used across the university. And he writes, if we could scale up to a large number of com computers like this in the lab, we can see that we indeed have a lot of computing power available to us. And you can imagine how this research project progressed. And I actually had the student email me a year later to say that they were still doing research on computing power and they had expanded to think about digital currencies and crypto mining. And I just thought how fascinating it was that this project opened up a field of study for him through this very connected um, you know, idea of, of, of examining a critical or contemporary issue and making it very personal and connected to the kinds of work that they were interested in. All right. And then this example here, this image is of a greenhouse on uh, the University of Toronto campus, and it's led to it led to studies about environmental science and food science, specifically dreaming up solutions to address food security in places where foods food might be scarce, and trying to figure out is there ways that we can produce herbs and other crops regardless of climate or temperature. So with these um, examples, and this is really moving from critically thinking about their um, about the global images that I had addressed, and now moving to their own personal community, personal spaces, they actually examined research in a very um, unique way that was personal to them. So when we look back at that initial triad where I was thinking about the learner, the environment, and communities, it meant that teaching could actually be transformed in a way that prioritized the environment and the community and the learner in these spaces. And when we think about education and the way that we might have been taught growing up and the way that our children are taught, we start to reimagine what education could really look like. And it's very easy to assume or to kind of fall into the the assumptions that education, the way that it's traditionally taught is the best way or the only way, because it's just so ingrained to us. But as we start to re envision or imagine um, educational tools and pedagogical options, we start to consider, well, what could learning look like? And also recognize that we're teaching students right now for futures that we know 
very little about. And that reality is extremely, extremely real. And of course, they will probably get positions and jobs and work in industries that don't yet exist. So getting them to think critically about contemporary issues allows them to be open-minded, allows them to gather multiple perspectives, and teaches them the kind of humility and humbleness we need to have in learning and in education. And that's quite important um, when we think that we know everything, but then we're coming to a place where we can expand that learning as well. So this idea of sort of critical thinking or critical thinkings is what I'm hoping that this educational practice is moving us towards. And it might mean that they are looking at a socio-scientific issue where this is a science issue or technological issue that's grounded in social dimensions, historical dimensions, environmental dimensions, or they might be looking at a data set or some sort of numerical um, set, and they're trying to rec reconcile how this, not, this data set makes sense and who was actually surveyed, let's say, in that space. What context uh, was the study happening in and how can we validate those numerical results or those statistics based on the kinds of things that we need to understand um, around how that number was produced. And students get kind of blown away when we have those kinds of conversations because um, when I initially talk to them about their experiences with science and math, they're usually saying it's they love it because it's they know that it's one way and it's universal and it's so factual and actual, sometimes they'll say. And then when I start to talk to them about, well, what if we were to think about it as being um, riddled with complexity and maybe there are nuances that actually don't make it as directed in the kinds of knowledge that you think, then they start to open up their imagination and be creative. And we need creative thinkers in mathematics um, because of course there is gonna be things that we need to solve that require creative thinking. And of course we need imagination in science as we're thinking about um, the future as well. So I often contemplate my time as an educator and, and in higher education and university pedagogy. And I consider it as an education, sorry, and consider it as education as the practice of freedom. Now this statement is from Bell Hooks that originates also from Paulo Freire's work, where education um, as the practice of freedom will come easiest to those of us who believe that our work is not merely to share information, but to share in the intellectual and spiritual growth of our students. So this is to teach in a manner that respects and cares for the souls of our students, which is so essential if we are to provide the necessary conditions where learning can most deeply and intimately begin. Um, that sort of disruptive thinking can therefore begin with within the soul and through the prospective careers of our students because they start to think a little bit more differently. And when I think about this term critical thinkers, I remember um, attending uh, uh, Indigenous Leadership and Business Congress in 2022, and it was virtual. And one of the pal panelists spoke about their experiences in education, in learning as a child, when they were taken to attend a Christian school and um, the panelists specifically said the school's purpose was to remove their ability to be critical thinkers. So we are living in uh, a space and well, teaching in an institutional space that was created with very um, pointed intentions. And now we're trying to reimagine and rethink education so that it actually creates critical thinkers and not actually removes their ability to critical think, critically think. And that means, and it requires us to actually change the way that we teach, change the way that we assess our students um, and a myriad of other things as well. So those are those, those possibilities. So I want to thank you um, for this talk. I feel like I've 
spoke very quickly and breezed through it super, super fast, but maybe that will give us more time for questions. Um, and also, if anyone would like to connect with me or reach out, you can always email me. I do have a website, but I'm also on uh, Instagram and, and Twitter under Strawberry Jedi. I'm happy to share the premise for, for those for that Strawberry Jedi as well. All right, let me. Okay, we're at the question and answer part of our lecture tonight, and I'm not seeing any questions yet in the chat. Um, we'll just wait a few minutes and see if anything comes up. Um, have you ever had to debate all these concepts you've just introduced us to with with more traditional mathematicians and scientists? Not yet. <laughs> Um, I think that uh, in the scholarship and in the fields of these particular educational fields, like mathematics education or science education, uh, we are thinking about different ways that we would, you know, teach and educate. But it is difficult um, to imagine how some concepts need to be taught in very particular ways. And so sometimes you will have mathematicians or scientists sort of going through sort of the, you know, the lecture and teaching students sort of like the ways in which like the computational reasoning or procedural ways of knowing because there's such a method to that to that understanding. Um, and so and I also like to like to um, premise that this by saying that those those ways of learning are important too. Right to kind of have those sort of foundational understanding and to make sure that those are sort of the grounding so that we can think more complex and think more critically about some of these ideas. So sometimes we do need those sort of foundational spaces. I find too that when we move towards the university level, um, students are like, oh, this is such a different way of learning from high school or elementary. But I feel that high school is preparing them with the foundational knowledge in order to be able to be more open to the kinds of thinking that, you know, we're teaching them at the university level. Um, so I think that, yeah, I think that there is some tensions, but I think at the same time, it's sort of like a balance in the, in the pedagogical ways that we teach. Um, and, and there's no wrong answer, but we need to kind of move forward as well. Yeah, it sounds so much like an opening and a flourishing of taking all that foundational stuff and, oh, let's build on it. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Can I ask you, have you ever had an aha moment where it all came crystal clear to you that this is the way to go? Um, I, I mean, through this research, I've had so many aha moments because the students, so, Every time I teach this sort of pedagogical way of teaching, something new comes out of it. It's never the same. So you can imagine some of the projects, for instance, the projects that I shared in, in this talk, uh, they're from spanning from different grad, like from grad studies to undergraduate studies to middle school. So every time I see a project where students like, hey, this is an actual issue that's happening in my community. I want to research it. Those are aha moments for me where I'm like, how beautiful it is for you to be able to work and research and devote your time to understand this issue in a more important way. Um, so those are so that I have those aha moments when I'm with my students and they're sharing something like that. Yeah, and I'm imagining your students having aha moments in the first lecture or the second lecture, or they go home and they start to think about it. Yes, they do, because I think too that um, students sometimes think that their, their understanding of something is very specific, and sometimes it's limiting um, as well. Like they sort of, I go, this is how I know this. And then when we start to recognize how complex it might be, they're like, wait, I actually could evolve in my understanding in this area. I could probably master excellence in understanding this particular, um, you know, concept or idea. And so they're also thinking about the way in which their mind 
is able to solve these solutions, which is really powerful. Yes. Okay, I'm monopolizing the conversation here. There are questions in the chat now. So let's go through them. I'm just right. at the top of them. Um, Elizabeth asks, what has been the most interesting project or issue that you or your students have worked on? Oh, um, so I actually did do a project in North Bay. I was teaching actually at Nipissing University and um, my students had did a project where they, they were working with indigenous youth at the reserve that was close by. And they taught them with elders how to make medicine kits. And that project was so profound because what they did as well was they looked at um, the different kinds of medicines that they were putting into the kit and they examined the Western uses of them. And then they looked at the indigenous uses of them as well. And that was just amazing because they were trying to bridge these two worlds together. And much later on, actually, I read a book, I'm sure people have heard of it, it's called Braiding Sweetgrass. And I was like, oh, how beautiful. Like, and it was about this sort of botanist trying to reconcile, you know, their indigenous ways of knowing and, you know, kind of living with the land with their, you know, their work as a, as a scientist doing empirical research in a very, uh, you know, observational way. And they were trying to like bridge that. And I was like, oh, I, I felt like I witnessed that earlier on with these youth trying to reconcile these two worlds together. That was a really great project. Thank you for that question. Okay, the next question is, did you actually mean to suggest that religious education is the antithesis of critical thinking? Uh, I need to read that question. So did you, sorry, did you say religious? Yes, religious education. I don't know that I use that term. Religious I, education. I honestly don't remember hearing it. <laughs> <up. laughs> yeah, I never use that term. I'm I uh so maybe maybe the person who asked the question, if you want to clarify, and we'll go on to the next question. And if we have a clarification, we can go back to that one. Um Fabio says, thank you for sharing. This is inspiring and thought provoking. Can you speak about examples that include the voice of the marginalized and oppressed as a way to address biases? Oh, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, so, uh, like I said, um, I, I'm actually participating in a program where at the University of Toronto in Mississauga, where we have high school students, um, actually attend a university course and they get a university course. And um, they're all um, black identifying students. So there is that need to have, you know, a greater number of students from that marginalized group in the university setting. So how do we create opportunities for them to see themselves as belonging in, in academic spaces, um, but also how do we create opportunities where they can flourish in a way that is connected to their own like knowledge systems, ideas, beliefs as well. So that is one really great example right now um, in terms of these kinds of projects. And I think that's, those are the kinds of examples that we need more of where there are actually institutional um, projects that are happening. Um, I know I have a few scholars that does work with Indigenous um, uh, community building where they have elders connect with their students in their classroom and they do an entire um, course um, through the land. And th these, are, these are ways of um, making change systemically because we could just, you know, try our best to kind of like I don't know, share knowledge within our courses that are connected, but we actually really do need to create spaces um, as well for students to actually be present and to come and elders and other community members to come into the university as well. I think too, the other um, thing about sort of addressing, you know, these sort of biases that that are, are happening is to kind of break these biases because that's exactly what they are, right? And and we cannot um, assume, um, uh, you know, a particular you know reality for any group of people. What we what we can do is 
uh, recognize that everyone has the the human right, you know, to have an, a higher education if they uh, do choose to do so, and that makes making sure that if they choose to do that, that we create spaces within the institution that they can flourish and belong and continue, because sometimes they're there. They'll get accepted and they'll come and they don't complete the programs um, because of, you know, these conflicts. It's, it reminds me of the Robin Will Kimmerer book, um, Braiding Sweetgrass, where she really questioned whether or not her place was in, you know, science, in botany and academia. Yes. Okay, the next question is, I'm wondering if you struggle with the demands of requirements for peer reviewed material when other potentially useful materials are created outside the academic world, for example, in the indigenous environmental knowledge. Thanks. That's such a great question. Um, so I, I, I kind of want to say, okay, maybe I struggle with it. Maybe I don't. I kind of actually try to think really what is scholarly output. And I don't want to prescribe to the idea that it's only peer reviewed, you know, journals and materials. I want to think that scholarly output can have many forms. And if I could find um, open source journals, if I can find like really well written um, statistics or analyses done by reports and working groups. There's so many different communities that are also doing their own research and creating these kinds of policies and reports um, that that work in itself should also be great scholarly output. A lot of them are applying great methods in acquiring the knowledge or the data or the statistics that are in those pieces of, of writing. So, you know, you kind of use your own assumptions to qualify what you're reading and determine the credibility and validity of that. Um, and then, of course, I would use it, of course, and, and, and use that work to be a part of, um, you know, my own material. And I do encourage my students to do that, too. Um, I do actually have them, you know, create papers or do presentations that have to be sourced. And I say some of them should be peer reviewed and some of them should be from other sources. And I ask them to um, question the credibility of those sources before they actually use it as well. So they know that it's credible and they can think about what makes it credible in those spaces. So it's really redefining and expanding the academic world. Yes, I think that we need that actually too. So we can think about how we actually share knowledge because I mean, this is for, is an excellent example that I've never done a public lecture. So it's like I'm doing this research and it only gets circulated in these very small scholarly circles. Um, so I will go to conferences or, you know, share it in publication or a chapter in a book that's also peer reviewed and edited. Um, but really, how is this knowledge being disseminated to um, educators or other people that might value from the work that we're doing? So, yeah, so this is an example of, of you know, the importance of seeing what other kinds of output we can do. That's also scholarly. Yes. Okay. The next question is about the, um, the generations. How do you navigate as a parent and an expert in pedagogy of science communication when your children demonstrate new ways of learning, for example, Google Classrooms, YouTube videos, when we learn through traditional textbooks and research at a real library? Oh, wow. This person I knew in middle school, that's amazing. Um, oh, yeah, Nadia, I can see the name now. Uh, this is such a great question. Um, because um, it's, I mean, not the way that we are are making knowledge and receiving knowledge is evolving and it is changing and we are living in the 21st century and we have to recognize that. And I have seen it in my own practice as an educator as well. So that's like that those examples of those images where I was like, and I did it with my students and there was images on a wall with post-it notes of them, you know, making inquiries and thinking critically about it to an active learning classroom where I can show an image and they can literally search the term and pull up a whole bunch of things that are, you know, possible um, and in connection with it in real time. Like, oh, there's an article that was just 
you know, written yesterday um, about this exact issue. So I think that um, as a, a parent, I'm encouraging of the kinds of technologies that are available to, to my children to use them. Um, but I'm also recognizing that there ha that they have to be credibly sourced as well. So I'm also trying to help them navigate, you know, what is source material. And I actually find it funny when, you know, when my, my child might mention a song and I'm like, what's that song from? And they're like, oh, it's from Fortnite or whatever. I'm like, no, no, no. That song is actually from this particular musical artist from the 1980s, you know, so even they actually have to start kind of doing their own digging to research the truth as well, right? Yeah. Um, uh, that's a great question though, thank you. Yeah, and in that question, they talked about the real library of yesteryear. Real libraries have also been redefined and expanded and, and we have gone electronic. So, so much has changed. Academia has changed, libraries have changed too. Yeah, oh yeah, and I forgot about that. I think real library is just such an incredible concept. Yes, okay. Um, the next question is about the importance of including creativity and in the approach to research. It says, I think you mentioned at the outset about being a parent, and so I'm wondering how your research might influence your way of educating your own children. Actually, this is building on the last question. Um, yes, how, how thank you. you. Yeah. This place? Um, yeah, this is a great question. You know, because I teach mathematics, it's so funny. I I will I have this slide where uh, we talk about how we learned mathematics and it's through rote memorization. Um, we're learning to 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 do mathematics with speed, right? To be able to uh, you know be able to multiply or whatever it might be with speed. And then I talk about how real mathematicians work, and they actually could work on one problem for many years. I have a, a colleague that literally looked at one math problem and it was their PhD. Um, so we talk about why it's so important to have this creativity because you act because sometimes the way that we're taught about certain epistemologies isn't actually the way that it looks like in real life. And in real life, it requires us to be imaginative and to kind of think out of the box in order to answer or find a solution for something. And it also requires us to have um, you know, multiple perspectives, like others around us to collaborate and uh, question and think about, well, how did you go about, you know, doing that work or solving that, that as well. So, so when I think about educating my own children, um, I really want them to like have humility, to be humble enough to say, okay, I think I know a little bit about this area, but I know that I could probably learn more. Um, so what else is there to know about this? This particular research or this idea, and it might not be looking at a textbook or Google or real library. It might actually um, look very different, like asking questions in the community, speaking to elders, and and so on. Yeah, I think this next question I'm a little confused by it, but it's: Have you ever been invited to a class with special support? And think about moving from independency to I, I. I'm not quite sure. Um, Carlton, if you want to expand on your question, you can either get into the chat, let us know what it is you're thinking. Can you make hide nor hair of that one? Yeah, and I mean, I teach in a university space with such diverse uh, learning journeys, academic backgrounds. So there's always so many different types of supports that are available to my students, not just within my classroom, but within the academic skills center, um, the uh, counseling, the academic counseling that's provided. So, so it's actually ingrained in the, the, the courses and the practice and the classes that I teach the, you know, other kinds of support. I don't know if it's academic supports or what other kind of special supports you're thinking about, but it's certainly very um, top of the mind in terms of how we approach teaching and how we sort of, I guess, differentiate our instruction when we're teaching as well. Yeah. Um, 
Adriana asks, as an instructor, what do you find to be the most challenging concepts or ideas for students to grab, grasp when teaching them to understand science and knowledge more broadly as social constructs? Uh, well, um, I think learning theories are, are very challenging concepts for many students. And the first thing I tell them is that there are so many learning theories and I'm only sharing a few. So, for instance, this this learning theory around critical pedagogy and and place based education, but also I do bring in collaborative work, which is based on um, theories around social cultural theory and constructivism. So these kinds of concepts around learning and cognitive science and metacognition. I find students to, um, I don't know that they struggle with it. I think it's just new. I think that they've just been in a learning space where they're just kind of learning everything and taking it all in. And then um, when they come into my courses where I'm teaching from my scholarship, I'm really, really um, getting them to think about their thinking and think about learning and to reevaluate what their identity is as a learner. And to recognize sort of those evolving identities as a learner. And I think those are really challenging for students because they're like, oh, so maybe I have other types of intelligences that I can draw on. And when they sometimes come and they're like, well, I'm this very particular type of learner. And then they start to recognize that actually they're not actually one type of learner. You're actually all types of learners. You just have to think about the context and the experience that you're in. Um, that you're learning in and decide which kind of intelligence are you going to draw on? And that's really important. And I think students, um, they get a little jarred because sometimes they're right. I'm really nervous being in this class. I'm a, I'm a very kinesthetic learner or, or whatever it might be. And I'm like, well, that's okay. You're actually a learner of all types. Um, so you will learn, you will learn through this space as well in, in those types of intelligences that you have to draw on. Um, so I think that's usually one of the hardest for them to kind of like grasp. And then I think by the end of my course, it's usually like a 12 week long. They start to recognize that they have the potential to learn anything really. Yes, that's the last of our questions. Um, there are many thanks for your talk. People have been charmed by your talk. People have had their minds open by your talk. So thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Um, that takes us to the end of our session tonight. Um, if you're interested in providing feedback, it's always very valuable to us. We'd love to hear it. Um, you can fill out a survey. There's the link that will be put into the chat box or you can scan the QR code with your phone. Um, but that's the end of our program tonight. Thank you very much for coming. Hope to see you again. Good night, everybody.